I am Charlotte Edwards. I'm a feature writer, interviewer, and columnist at the Evening Standard. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the RSA today, for today's event and to introduce you to our very special guest, Elizabeth Day. <laughs> um, Elizabeth is an author and journalist, interviewer, really good advice giver, and host of, how to, how to, of the How to Fail uh, podcast, um, in which she chats to successful people about their important failures along the way. Their stories are cleverly interwoven with her own in her new book, How to Fail. It's an insightful, informative, thoughtful, funny, sometimes sad book, and very much of its time now. Uh, it celebrates the messiness of life, the bad dates, the heartache, the need sometimes to just run away. It celebrates being a woman with all the very many associated anxieties. It celebrates risk. It celebrates family, friends, and love. And obviously, it celebrates failure in all its multifaceted glory. <laughs> I've known Elizabeth since 2003. I came back from a six-week foreign assignment on the Sunday Telegraph, and she was sitting in my chair. <laughs> we had a brilliant colleague called Chris Hastings, who was very eccentric and always needed a glamorous assistant. It had been me, but when Elizabeth arrived while I was in Iraq, she stepped into the role. <laughs> Reading this book, I realized how much Elizabeth has packed into the years since, and perhaps how little I suppose I knew her then. I didn't, for instance, know <laughs> that, she, that she had an affair with one of the executives to get her job. Which one? <laughs> Can't Actually, I'm joking. It's a because joke. As she was, a joke. It's a joke. It's a very bad joke. It's, as she reveals in the book, it was a rumour, because in those days, attractive women who were, assumed, were assumed to be either sleeping with or related to someone to get a job. But I do remember feeling distinctly uneasy when she was asked to try out the orgasm machine. Yes, she was uh, trust, tried to write about this for our sweaty trouser rubbing bosses. Mm -hmm. um, and in the book, she does talk a lot about the workplace and how to fail in the workplace. And it was very interesting and really resonated with me as somebody who worked alongside, um, alongside her. So um, let's get started. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Elizabeth Day. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I mean, who could replace Charlotte as a glamorous assistant? Certainly not me. Um, I am so delighted to be here because I think this is the most beautiful room that I've ever given a talk in. And um, I very much like the freeze showing the evolution of human knowledge to its apex here, me, right now. Um, I wanted to start today by asking you all a question. And my question is, how many of you hate it when someone starts a talk saying that they want to ask people a question? <laughs> if you just put your hands up. Yes, me too. Um, I promise you that that's the extent of the audience participation. I just have two more questions. Um, how many people here have a problem with the idea of admitting that they have failed? Well, that's quite a lot of you. And how many people have failed in the last month? And that's almost everyone. <laughs> and therein, I think, lies both the problem and the opportunity. Because all of us fail in myriad ways almost every single day. And yet we live in an age where it is very difficult to be honest about failure, where it seems as if everyone else is nailing their life. Because we live in an age of curated perfection, of social media, of Instagram filters, and it can feel quite lonely sometimes to be vulnerable. But I'm here today as, apparently, the poster girl for failure. <laughs> this is what a journalist called me a few weeks ago. Uh, my parents are very proud, as you can imagine. Um, and, and when she asked me what it felt like to be the poster girl for failure, uh, to begin with, I was slightly taken aback, because I thought, well, I have other skills and qualities. Uh, I'm very good at toasting crumpets, for instance. Um, but then I thought about what she was asking me, and of course, the answer was that I'm delighted to be known as the poster girl for failure. Because what I've realized through doing the podcast and writing the book, that it is paradoxically when we are our most vulnerable and when we choose to be open and honest about that vulnerability, that we become our strongest selves. Because not only do we learn more about who we are, but we're able to connect on a very human level with other people. 
The same journalist asked me where I first came up with the idea for the podcast, How to Fail with Elizabeth Day. And the short answer is, I got dumped. In October 2017, a long-term relationship came to an end. It was brutal, it was out of the blue, and it was three weeks before my 39th birthday. So I faced my 39th birthday with something akin to trepidation, because I was in no way where I had thought I would be at that stage in my life. During my 30s, I had had a very busy time. I had got married and then divorced. I had tried and failed to have children. I had two unsuccessful rounds of IVF and a miscarriage at three months. And when I look back at my 30s, I realized that they had been a decade of some professional success. I had written four novels. I was lucky enough to make my living as a journalist. But they had been a decade also of immense personal transition and personal sadness. And so at the back of this relationship ending, I took myself to LA, which is a very good place to go to lick your wounds because it's sunny. And uh, the time difference means that you don't get that many emails after 2 p.m. And uh, it was while I was in LA that I found myself listening to a lot of podcasts because as anyone who has ever been heartbroken will know, when you're in that state of mind, every single pop song seems to have a peculiar and specific resonance to your heartbreak. So I was listening to a lot of podcasts, and one of the podcasts I was listening to was Where Shall We Begin with Esther Perel. And I don't know how many of you listen to it, but she is a fantastic relationship therapist, and she basically opens up the door to her consulting room during the course of this podcast. So you get a kind of bird's eye view of relationships going wrong and then being put right. And at the same time as I was listening to this podcast, I was having the most incredible conversations with my predominantly female friends about what it meant to have loved and lost and what we had learned from various heartbreak and where we were professionally and what this meant and what it meant not to have children when one had always thought one would. And I began to look very differently at my failures and I began to see that each one had taught me something so valuable about who I was and what I wanted going forwards, that actually each time I had ended a job or ended a relationship or a friendship had fallen by the wayside, each time that had happened, it had been a lesson wrapped up in a mistake. It had been a nudge from the universe in a slightly different direction. And I started to wonder how great it would be if we could open up those conversations into a more public forum. And that was the genesis of How to Fail. I should actually say How to Fail with Elizabeth Day because I failed to name my own podcast. <laughs> uh, it turns out there is another How to Fail with an exclamation mark at the end, which was set up by two very litigious American women. <laughs> so How to Fail with Elizabeth Day uh, launched in July 2018. And for the first eight guests, I really corralled a lot of friends and contacts and got them to do it as a favor. And I asked each guest before they appeared to come up with three failures, so three instances in their life where they felt that things hadn't gone according to plan. And they could range from the seemingly superficial, bad dates, failed driving tests, lost tennis matches, to the more profound. And it is a great honor now to listen to those people's stories because the topics we've discussed, discussed include living with depression, homelessness, death by suicide, failed family relationships, and it really has been the most beautiful journey of discovery. But those first eight episodes I put out into the world, genuinely thinking that maybe half a dozen people might listen, and two of those people would probably be my parents. I sold my wedding dress on eBay to fund the first few episodes. I drew my own logo with felt tip pens, as you can probably tell if you've ever seen it. <laughs> In fact, every time I look at the logo, I get a sense of real familiarity because the circle, it's a rosette with how to fail on it, and the circle of the rosette I drew by tracing the outer line of the bottom of my favorite mug. Anyway, How to Fail went out there in July 2018, and within three weeks, it was number three on the iTunes chart. Uh, it was, ironically, the most successful thing I have ever done. <laughs> and off the back of the success of that first season, I got offered a book deal, and that is How to Fail, everything I've ever learned from things going wrong. 
and it is part memoir, part manifesto. So I talk about the idea of reclaiming failure, and I also talk about anecdotes from my own life, including trying out the orgasm machine. <laughs> it didn't work, by the way. And I am a serious journalist. Um, and I've also interwoven things that I've learned through my podcast guests. Um, it's been a really incredible thing, this journey, because it's made me realize how much we were all thirsting to talk about failure and how alone so many people feel in their failures and how ashamed they feel of acknowledging them in public. And it's really been wonderful opening up a space where people can be more honest. I've learned a lot of things from my guests on the podcast and I wanted to share with you five of them. Let's call them five principles of failure. The first is that failure just is. And that might sound incredibly obvious, but what I mean by that is that failure is just a fact in the same way that success is just a fact. It is just something that is going to happen to you. No matter how well you behave, no matter how many people you try to please, no matter how well you do, failure is going to happen. And we can actually choose how we respond to it. So that instead of thinking, this has failed, I'm a terrible person, this is hopeless, we could choose instead not to respond negatively, but to choose to learn from it and to treat it as a lesson. And this is brought home to me by a man called Haymin Sunim, who is a Buddhist super monk. And to be a super monk, apparently you need one million followers on Twitter. <laughs> and um, I had a conversation with him for the podcast, and it was really interesting because I had just come off the back of a very frantic day in London. And Haymin, who is South Korean, was as you might expect from a Buddhist super monk, very, very calm and very zen. But the way that that manifested itself during the interview was that he spoke quite slowly and left a lot of space for gaps. And so in my head, I was like, does he hate my questions? Does he hate me? Is this terrible? Am I asking the wrong thing? But actually, it was just him observing and coming up with the appropriate answer. And he taught me the power of observation, that sense that when your thoughts are running away with you, you can step back and you can choose to observe them because you exist separately from your thoughts. And that brings me onto my second principle of failure. Your brain is just an organ. Your brain is an organ in the same way that your heart is an organ. Your heart produces blood, your brain produces thoughts. You would not think that you were defined by your blood, therefore why would you think you were defined by your thoughts? This was something taught to me by a man called Mo Gaudat, who was a former chief business officer at Google X. And Google X is the so-called moonshot factory that develops madcap ideas like uh, internet powered by balloons and self-driving cars. And Mo was a phenomenally successful person. He had everything materially he could possibly desire. He had a wife, he had two lovely children, but he wasn't happy. And so he spent 12 years applying his engineering and scientific research skills to developing an algorithm for happiness. This algorithm was put to the ultimate test when his beloved son Ali died at the age of 21 during a routine operation. And Mo was set loose on a tidal wave of grief. But by applying this algorithm, he said that he saved his own life. And one of the foundational ideas of this algorithm is that you exist separately from your brain. And Mo has taken this to such an extreme that he actually calls his brain a name. He decided to name his brain Becky, after the most annoying girl at school. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry if there are any Beckys in the audience, because I'm sure you're lovely. But uh, at Mo's school, there was this girl, Becky, who was always pointing out when things went wrong and was never positive and never pointing out when things went right. So Mo decided to call his brain Becky, and he said that recently he had an argument with his daughter, and he was walking down the street, and his brain was telling him that he was a hopeless parent, that his daughter no longer loved him, that he might as well give up trying to be a father. And he stopped himself in the street, and he said, Becky, and he gave his brain a good talking to. He said, Becky, I would like you to provide me with evidence for that assertion. And if you don't have evidence, I would like you to replace that negative thought with a positive one. And Mo said that the more you did this, the more you build up your emotional resilience, the more you flex that muscle. The third thing that I've learned from my guests, and it's quite a surprising one, 
But I'm constantly surprised how many of my interviewees felt that their 20s were a failure. And I think that when you're in your 20s, it's an incredibly difficult decade to go through, especially if you're in them right now, in this age of social media and constant comparison. I think they're a difficult decade because for many of us, they'll be the first decade that we come out of full-time education and into full-time employment. They're a decade during which we try and establish ourselves professionally and personally in romantic relationships. They're a decade in which we're trying to find ourselves, and we're trying to do all of this while other people seem to be having a much better time than us, and we're meant to be doing it all whilst also baking perfect Nigella Lawson chocolate brownies at the weekends. <laughs> and what I want to tell people who are still in their 20s now is that I honestly think that one of the greatest achievements of that decade is living through them. When you hit 30, it's a real liberation. And as someone who turned 40 last November, I can tell you it's even better. Because it turns out that all those people who said, age is great because you accumulate experience and wisdom, they weren't actually lying. Age is great. <laughs> I feel so much more in tune with myself as a result and so much more empowered because of it. The fourth thing I learned is that failure can be viewed as data acquisition. This was brought home to me by my fellow podcaster, Deborah Francis-White, who does the Guilty Feminist podcast. And her background was in acting. She did a lot of improv, and she trains lots of students at RADA. And part of improv is part of embracing the notion of failure and losing the crowd. And you have to actively love the idea that you might suck at it. And she taught her RADA students to treat the first year of auditions after graduation purely as data acquisition. She said, I want you to go out there and know that you are not going to get a single part, but you are going to treat each audition as something you can learn from and information you can gather about what you want, how to do this, and to acquire specific knowledge related to the task you're trying to achieve. And this kind of blew my mind because she said that a lot of her students ended up getting parts because they'd put lot, a lot less pressure on themselves. And I felt that it could be applied to lots of different areas in life. For instance, dating. There's a whole chapter in my book about my dating failures. And part of the struggle for me when I started dating off the back of my divorce was that, first of all, the landscape had massively changed and I had to sign up to things called Bumble and Tinder and Hinge. I was like, does no one meet anyone in a bar anymore? Apparently not. But also because it was very difficult not to take rejections really personally. But then I realized, what if each rejection from someone is not actually something that I take and internalize but it is someone showing that they are not right for me. And it is taking me closer to the person who is right for me, and it is giving me valuable knowledge about who I am and what I want. And sure enough, I did meet the person who was right for me on Hinge. <laughs> the final thing that I've learned really loops back to what I was saying at the beginning, which is that we are at our most strong when we are willing to be open about our vulnerabilities. That is the ultimate source of human connection. One of the most inspiring guests I've ever had on the podcast is a man called Johnny Benjamin, who is not a household name, but is a phenomenal mental health campaigner. When Johnny was 20, he was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. And shortly afterwards, he found himself standing on the edge of Waterloo Bridge, about to take his own life. The pain had got so great that he could see no other way out. And it was at that moment that a stranger walked past him and, noticing Johnny's distress, stopped to talk to him. It was this single act of compassion and connection that pulled Johnny back from the edge. And six years later, Johnny launched an internet campaign to try and find that stranger. 319 million people responded, and eventually Johnny was reunited with Neil Laybourne. The two of them are now best friends, and they tour the country talking to corporations and schools about mental health. And when Johnny was telling this story to me, it was extremely emotional. We were both in tears. And it caused a wave of listener response. So many people got in touch to say that Johnny's bravery and courage in speaking about that had helped them feel it was worth continuing, had helped them feel it was less alone. And really what I'd like to end on is that idea 
that however bleak it feels, however much you think you have failed, please just cling on. Cling on that little bit longer. Because the real failure might be not finding out what happens next. Thank you. Um, so, in the book, which I read until very <laughs> late last night, and it is brilliant, um, your parents sound amazing. Um, so, your, uh, especially your father's job as a surgeon in Northern Ireland, doing, among things, um, uh, dealing with terrible injuries such as kneecapping. Um, and your mother is an academic and a lecturer who gave up work to help raise you. Um, it sounds like they taught you a lot, but I had two questions. First of all, what is the role in, of parents in preparing us for failure? And second, have they revealed to you anything of their own failures or what they feel were their failures? That's such a good question, and I've never been asked it before. And I think I'd like to start with the latter half of the question first, which is that m my parents find it extraordinarily difficult, I think, to talk to their children openly about failure. And I wonder if that, that, that's... A parental thing it's because you want your children to feel safe and looked after and perhaps by sharing their failures they worry that they might appear weak which is absolutely not the case at all and but I'm much more of an oversharer than they are <laughs> and there's a generational difference there as well so but one of the wonderful things about the podcast is that they've listened to every episode and it's opened up some really wonderful honest conversations between us and Obviously, they read the book, and I was extremely worried about them reading the book because I talk in there about, you know, having sexual relations. <laughs> and I was like, I've never spoken to my parents about that, and I wonder what they'll think. And also because I wanted them to feel that it was an accurate representation of who they were. Um, and they are amazing people, but there's so much stuff that we haven't ever spoken about. And again, I think that that's something... I'm 40, so my parents are now both in their 70s. It is generational and um, maybe cultural. Maybe it's a peculiarly sort of English sense, sensibility. Um, and I think that they think I'm quite funny and quite Californian and that my time in LA has rubbed off on me. You know, for instance, I'm very open in the book about the fact that I have therapy and neither of my parents would ever think of doing that. They would think <laughs> it, it, was, it was a slightly sort of strange and a self-indulgent almost thing to do. Um, but I think that they prepared me fantastically for failure because they made me feel that my ambitions were completely valid. They took me seriously as a young child, and I was quite an eccentric young child, as you'll know if you've read the book. And, um, you know, I loved the archers, and I wore corduroy trousers, and I decided at age four that I was going to be an author. And they did not humiliate me by saying that that was a ridiculous notion, and there were no authors in my family. Instead, they massively encouraged me because they read me stories and they encouraged me to read Jane Austen at a young age. And every time I wrote something, they would take time to read it and to praise me for it. And so that was a really wonderful thing. And I think um, giving a child a safe space in which to experiment about with their future selves is a really great thing that a parent can do. And I also think that another great thing a parent can do to prepare their children for failure, and my parents certainly did it with me, is to make it clear that the child is loved just for being the child, rather than what the child does well. So I was in no doubt that my parents valued me for the slightly eccentric, archers loving child that I was. And um, it wasn't a question of like, having to do well at exams. Um, so well, I think that that's, well. <laughs> I mean, I did that because, uh, I did that because I had a very, uh, I had a very strong internal critic and a sort of internal metric of my own success. And at school, I realized that if I did well at exams, I got praise for it and I wanted that to continue. So I tried really hard. And then obviously you leave school and you realize that you've actually done no work on who you are as a person. You're just a kind of exam machine. Um, and so that was like a whole other discovery in my twenties. Mm. Um, so I was going to ask you, so, so you wrote about, as I mentioned before, um, the workplace where you're pitched against each other in our, in our 
in our newsroom that happened. Um, and it's a sort of classic Fleet Street tactic, but it happens elsewhere, I'm sure. Um, this book celebrates solidarity and the sisterhood, but we, we all know women that have tried to kill us, um, <laughs> <laughs> or who still want to kill us even. And, I want, and, and are we getting better at supporting each other, or is this, um, this sisterhood thing a, a, a bit of a myth? I think we're massively getting better at supporting each other. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I remember being wildly intimidated by Charlotte and just thinking, oh my gosh, there's just no way I'll ever be as good as her. And you are pitted against each other, at least we were, in the early 2000s. And I, at that stage, did not have enough self-confidence or sense of who I was to say no to embarrassing commissions like try out an orgasm machine or go Which, by the way, we thought was terrible. The other, yeah, the, the other girls in the newsroom even then thought they're really yeah. doing that to you because you were younger. Yeah. And also because I was, a, I, I was colluding in my own self-deception in a way because I was desperate to be a feature writer and I was like, I will do anything that isn't having to report on the general synod as religious affairs correspondent. <laughs> so, oh, yes, I forgot. Yes, I was a religious affairs correspondent. But I think we're massively getting better. And I... I I have to pay great credit to younger women and the people behind the Me Too movement <coughs> who have shown me that a lot of what I accepted as just part and parcel mm. of my life working in a male-dominated industry, newspapers as it was at that time, that I just had to accept stuff that was sexist. And uh, it might have been casual sexism, but I, re I started to recategorize my own past when Me Too happened. And I thought I had been someone who had never experienced sexism. And I realized, of course, that I massively had, not only at work, but in relationships. And I think that has been an enormously solidarity um, empowering thing, Me Too. And I definitely now feel... Um, so raised up by other women, and I hope that I do that too, because there is space enough for all of us. And I wonder also if it's a function of age. I'm no longer in my 20s trying frantically to win a race that no one else is running in. But I think that there is that great sense when you're in your 20s that life does seem to be a kind of constant competition, and you're constantly evaluating yourself. And actually what I've realised is that it's not that you have your own lane and other people have theirs and you have your path and it is for you and if you don't feel that you are nailing everything in a certain decade maybe you're going to be someone who grows into your own in your 30s or in your 40s and I remember Nicole Kidman who clang name drop <laughs> um, she's in the book I've interviewed her before and she's amazing and I always remember hearing her speak at a magazine award ceremony and she was just about to turn 50 and she said, I want to tell you all out there, if anyone is scared of ageing, please don't be, because my 40s have been my best decade, because that's when she got Big Little Lies and all oh, those yeah. other fantastic roles. It's when she had both of her children, having never thought she'd be a, a, a biological mother. And, uh, and she was like, and I'm, I'm even more excited about turning 50. And it was just a really lovely thing to say to a room full of other women who worked in fashion. Mm, mm. <laughs> yeah. And, but your friends have been incredibly supportive as well, so it's not just work. So it, it, mm. in the workplace, you find people much more supportive now of other women. I do, but I'm also lucky in that I'm freelance, and so I don't have to go into an office. <laughs> um, I, d I don't love office yeah. politics. Um, yeah. And so I I'm extremely lucky now that I can kind of choose who I work with. And you're right, my friends have been phenomenally supportive. I, I, I think the greatest love affair, certainly the most consistent love affair of my life, is with my friends who have seen me through so many tough times and who have dusted me off and patched me up and sent me back out into the world. And I do not know what I would do without them. And one of the extremely powerful realizations I had was when my marriage was breaking down, I felt a terrible sense of shame over that failure. And I didn't tell anyone about it for a really long time. And I remember the first time that I mentioned it to my best friend, Emma, who is also a psychotherapist, which is a great combination. <laughs> um, I remember her saying, I love you more for having been real. Like, I love the fact that you are imperfect, and thank you for sharing that with me. And I was just, it was, it was uh, she just felt I'd been pretending to be someone else, and she was right. Mm. Um, so I was going to ask, um, oh, wait, hang on, time-wise. <laughs> um, so you've emptied out all your sort of emotional cupboards <laughs> um, and it helps us navigate and there's some brilliant stories in there. The bat story is a personal favourite. Um, 
uh, but I wondered if there was anything you'd kept back, whether there's a sort of locked attic full of yeah. dusty old <laughs> yeah. trunks that we're still to sift through. Yeah, some really ugly, <laughs> some really ugly clothes in that, in that dusty <laughs> trunk that I don't want to air in public. Yes, and that, again, that's a very good question because a lot of people extremely kindly have said how honest I've been in the book and how brave that is. And as I said, I, I, I don't perceive it as particularly brave. It's, it, it comes quite naturally to me to overshare. Um, but that bravery has limits. And although I am very honest in the book, I was very clear about what I wouldn't be writing about. So the chapters are thematic and they are carefully chosen because I felt that I was making a contract with the reader, which was, if I've chosen to write about this subject, I promise you I'm going to be honest. And I'm going to be honest about all the terrible things I've done and how stupid I've been. Um, and I'm going to be honest about what happened next. But there are absolutely things that are not in there. And I was extremely careful to stick to my own story rather than involving other people's. So um, what you read in there is very much my narrative, which I own and which I'm allowed to talk about. Um, but I was very aware that I didn't want to involve other people who hadn't given their permission. So any friend in there that I've quoted, <clears throat> I've asked whether I can use their real name. And they all said yes, which is a really nice thing. Um, but, but yes, there are still things I haven't and probably won't ever write about, partly because they involve other people. But I am wondering what to write next, because I'm like, I've just sort of used up all my life material now. <laughs> I've got to live some more life, and then maybe I'll have some more to talk about. <laughs> um, Zat Namsengera, who you interviewed on, on the podcast and who also is a mutual friend, um, I did say to him, what else should I ask you? And, and he said, how about, how do you handle success? Um, and it is something you've talked about in the book in terms of when you're talking to actors in interviews, how many people have you know, actually found it very difficult to deal mm. with fame? I mean, fame is not the same as success, but you know, they're sort of similar. Um, and I wondered how that was for you. How is it for you? How is it being successful <laughs> for me? Yeah. Well, thank you for the compliment inherent <laughs> in the question. Um, I, I'm aware, objectively, that um, the podcast and this book are genuinely the most successful things I've ever done. And there's something that I really like about that. <laughs> I, it, it appeals to my sense of the comic absurd <laughs> because I really have, through the act of writing about reclaiming failure, I've reclaimed my own failures. It has been extremely overwhelming, but in a good way. And I think I'm used to feeling overwhelmed in a bad way. And so it's quite strange to have so many lovely people to be talking to all of you today, um, to be in the Sunday Times bestseller list, which has never happened to me before, to, to have all of these things happen seems almost like I'm bracing myself for the thing that's about to go wrong because... Yeah. Um, and... Uh, so that's what we do. Yeah, <laughs> so it feels, it feels amazing, and I'm also cautious about it. But I think that that's good, and I think that I have, again, I've learned from Buddhist super monks and the like, that um, success is the same, it, it is a thing, <laughs> and failure is a thing, and in a way they are flip sides of the same coin, and actually one should strive to be stable and equable in relation to both. So there are certain things that I do now that I know help me, like I don't read Amazon reviews, and I don't read online comments underneath my articles, and that has taken me a long time to learn, but having made the decision, it's really easy. Because I, because I said, and that's also helped me, when I get a great review for the book, I'm so appreciative of it, and it makes me feel heard and understood, but it doesn't make me feel validated as a person anymore, in the same way that an online comment of negativity doesn't make me feel a failure as a person anymore, because I now know who I am apart from all of that. And I think that that's the great thing about experiencing whatever moderate degree of success I've experienced at a later age, because I've, I've formed my identity. I think it must be so hard being a child star. Um, and there is that famous saying about when you, you stay the age that you are when you become famous. And I think we've seen that with kind of Macaulay Culkin and Britney Spears and all those people. And... Um, yeah, I'm very grateful that I know who I am and that I've got my wonderful friends. And <laughs> um, so you've sort of 
It's quite interesting, this, the way that you've, uh, th that you've defined failure, because it is a personal thing. It's very personal in your book. It isn't necessarily, because obviously you're a model success story to yeah. <laughs> most of us who met you in your 20s, and, um, and yet it's not at all about that, because we might, I might not think a marriage failing is a bit big, well, it's a big deal, but, you know, is a failure in life, but because of how you'd set yourself up, it was a failure to you. And so, actually, are you saying that we should all be redefining slightly how mm. we think about these things? Yes, and that's very astute. That is exactly it. Um, failure is not a nuanced term in many respects, and I'm very aware that I sit here in a position of extreme privilege in that I'm a white middle-class woman and I own a laptop and that puts me in the top 0.5% of the global population. And there are experiences that I cannot speak to and would never seek to speak to. I do not know what it's like to be a person of color. I do not know what it's like to be transgender. I do not know what it's like to be homeless or to face living with a chronic illness. So with that extremely necessary caveat, I, failure is very personal and um, there are some things that you can't easily assimilate. But I think there's a lot of stuff that you can. And for me, failure was absolutely about, about not having achieved what I thought I was going to achieve when I was dreaming dreams of my future life as that four-year-old eccentric child who was listening to the archers. And in, in professionally, I achieved it because I was a journalist and I'd written novels. But personally, it, my life really imploded because I had always just imagined that I would meet someone at the appropriate time and I would get married and I would have children. And I think a lot of people feel that, although I'm thankful that the world now is a lot less binary mm. and that there are loads more opportunities to live different kinds of lives. And I think what I've learned from that is that there is no future me. So I used to be someone with a five-year plan and I've realised recently that that doesn't work for me because by the time you get to that five-year point often you'll have changed oh my God, and you don't actually five want five exactly you don't five actually want what you thought <laughs> yes well now I'm more like now I'm much more open to sort of current opportunities and that feels to me to be a, a, a calmer and happier way to live and I don't know what's going to happen for me personally and it is unlikely that I will be a biological mother and that has been a long sad and occasionally traumatic journey but I am at peace with it now in a way that I wasn't before and I've had to face that and confront it and I've also part of my dealing with that has been realizing how many opportunities I have in my life because of it mm. that's a really long waffly answer <laughs> oh, so now for now for answers uh, questions from the audience can't really see there. Oh, <laughs> there's a lady here. Sorry, yes. Okay, sorry, I can't really see. There's a lady at the front and a lady at the back. Oh, okay. So, do, do, do you, um, whoever's, where's the microphone? Do, do, do you want to go first, then at the back? We'll or go at back the front first. here. <laughs> Everyone's got like. Hi there. I think we, we, you know, we do need to be um, have a sense of equanimity. You know, here, you know, things come and go, and you know, I, I personally don't believe a lot of people do that we attract failure to us if we want to learn a lesson. I think it's just there. But how do we deal with the impact of other people's failures on ourselves? Yeah, like other people realising that you're not good, that, like failing to realise how great you are and wanting to dump you. I mean, it's outrageous. <laughs> um, I think, again, that's a very good question, but I think the only thing that you can own and have responsibility over is who you are and how you act. And so if someone does something to you or if someone fails to be there for you, often it's highlighting, for me anyway, it highlights something that um, I'm lacking or that um, I need to learn about myself. I've had this situation recently where a good female friend has distanced herself and I find that tremendously difficult to assimilate because friendship is so important to me and I pride myself on being a good friend. And it's made me question why I am so desperate to keep friends and that's made me understand that I fear being existentially alone and it's almost like I fear the passing of time. And anyway, that's a long-winded way of saying that it's taught me something about how I view life 
and that has been tremendously helpful to me. And what my friend does or doesn't do, and whether she chooses to be my friend going forward or not, is her deal. And I have to allow her to go through her stuff. And that's difficult when it involves emotions and when, for instance, it's the end of a relationship. And I would just say, give yourself time to feel sad and get over the end of something. And then after that, after the six week period of, of lying in the bath, eating crumpets and watching reality TV, um, after that six week-ish period is over, try and assess it in a more objective way and observe what you're thinking and what it's teaching you. There's a lady here at the front. First of all, thank you, really interesting, and I'm going to take up a lot of your tips. Um, you. The question I have is, you mention a lot of the, um, the reviews and ghastly comments that you get <laughs> occasionally. Now, to some extent, I thought that was weird, that you don't want to read them. Now, someone like you is a positive person and would be able to challenge mm. those people who've made these um, possibly <coughs> incorrect accusations or comments. So wouldn't that be a way of coping with the possible failure, but actually not, because you feel you're a success. Yeah, oh, God, what a lovely question, and I love your jacket. Is it a jacket? It's beautiful on you. Um, um, sorry, I made everyone turn around there. But, um, I, uh, don't get me wrong, I really want to read the reviews. I really do. It's like a scab that I need to pick. But it's a bit like the early phase of, I keep talking about relationships, I promise you that I have more to say, <laughs> but it's a bit like the early phase of um, dating someone. I don't want to know about their exes. And that's not because I can't know or I'm going to be worse or better than them and there's no comparison. It's just because I know that I need a phase of time to bed in to the notion that I am dating this person and they like me enough. And in the same way, I need time even now, to bed into the fact um, that I have written a book and I need to claim the fact that I think it's a good book. <laughs> but it's take, I'm, I struggle with that. So uh, it's my, that's my way of saying that sometimes when I read a negative comment on Amazon, it really unmoors me and it, and it makes me question what I've done and whether I've done it wrong and whether I should have done it better because I still have a grain of people-pleasing in me. And actually, when you try and people-please everyone who's leaving a comment on your Amazon, <laughs> you end up not being yourself, and it's an, it's an exhausting way to live your life, and it's not really a, a, a fun way to live your life. So I think, I, just for now, I need to leave the comments. And also because this book is so personal, and it is a memoir, I think I will find it harder if someone from Amazon says, I hated this book, not to read that as I hated you. <laughs> And, um, and it's just my way of giving myself a bit of breathing space to come to terms with that. But maybe next year, I'll be reading them in a very positive way. <laughs> so over at the front, we've got two people here. Thank you for your talk okay. um, on how to fail. Uh, it sounds like it's a key to success to me because recognizing failing it can be seen as a, um, a key of developing resilience and especially taking feedback, whether positive or negative. But do you think maybe we need awareness in order to tone down vulnerability, not to encourage it? Okay, yeah. So uh, I, that's a very good point. And I think I'm not, act, I'm not advocating actively pursuing failure. I don't think failure should be like an ultimate goal. I don't think you should try and fail your A-levels or try and not win a race. I'm a big believer in <laughs> exams being important and um, trying hard being extremely important. But I think that it is possible to educate people to try hard and to be the best versions of themselves It, your question is about vulnerability. Yeah. So people should be less vulnerable. I don't think you can encourage vulnerability. I think it just exists. I think it exists in everyone. And therefore, to deny it would be denying something that is fundamentally human. But you disagree with me, which is absolutely fine. <laughs> because I'm not taking that as a personal indictment of who I am. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, I'm just wondering if implicit in what you've been talking about, because you've talked about 20s, 30s and 40s, is almost like a how and when to fail. Mm. There is a time element to this. And embracing going through your failures earlier so that you can learn earlier and put it into practice for more of the rest of your life could actually be a very positive way to embrace it. In other words, take, turning it the other way around there, um, if some of the experiences you have, even at a, in a workplace, are the worst ones that could happen to you, but they happen to you earlier, you're more likely to almost have a competitive advantage because you've been there, you've seen it before, and you actually can get on and move through it, whilst other people are still just struggling it, whether it's sexism or mm. whatever else it might be in the workplace. So there's, there's almost an implicit sense, and that's what I'm going to explore with you. It's not just how, but when. Embrace going into it and taking it on to get the most out of it. Yeah, I love that idea. I think that's a, that's a, a, a brilliant and very sophisticated concept. And I talk in the book about that how some um, venture capitalist firms... So in Silicon Valley, the idea of failure is quite trendy. Um, and there are some venture capitalists who refuse to invest in people unless their first two businesses have failed because they believe that through those failures the potential entrepreneur has learned valuable lessons and their third business will be a stonking success. And, uh, and that's shown to be proven and true. And I agree with you that, I mean, I, 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 at the same time as thinking it's never too late to change your life, um, obviously it would have been better for me if I had got married and divorced when I was in my early 20s, got that out of the way, and um, then still had like, the biological capacity to pursue what I thought I wanted, which was a biological motherhood. So I do think that that's a really good way of educating school children alongside educating them to do well at exams. And I think a lot of my school years, the emphasis was very much on academic achievement and not very much on personal development. So as I was joking to Charlotte, I became a kind of exam machine but I didn't really know or understand who I was, and it meant that I made a lot of mistakes in my personal life. So, yeah, it was a great idea. Thanks. So, is there any more questions? I'm over there. Oh, there, sorry. <laughs> Are there two there? Oh, there's three Let's there. have the man. Oh, oh, there. Sorry to embarrass you. <laughs> Should we have a man first? Yes, I, yeah. uh, I think there's three people there, so if the three of you want to share the microphone. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, sure. You mentioned treating failure as data acquisition, but what about people who look at your narrative and have their interpretation? How do we um, stick to our, pers our personal understanding of what's taking place? And if someone has a different interpretation of what uh, we're going through? Well, what I think is that how people perceive you is actually none of your business, and not in a nasty way, but, but you can have no agency or control over that. So how someone <coughs> thinks of you and views you, you in a way, it, it's, it's going to diminish who you are if you allow yourself to be disproportionately affected by that. Because you're doing what you're doing, and you're being yourself, and that's great, <laughs> and that's all you can be, and you are unique and put on this planet for a reason. And if someone else has an issue with that or interprets it differently, that's their life and their path. And I just don't think, as someone who used to be a, an inveterate people pleaser, I can honestly tell you that it is extremely liberating to care much, much less now what people think, what other people think. Well, there are two more questions. Oh, there's a lady there. Thank you. And then um, one over here. I'm interested to know if um, the therapy that you had was a big part of the changes within yourself and whether that helped you to deal with the failure, failures in your life? Yes, it was enormously big. And again, I'm uh, very aware that I'm fortunate enough that I can pay for therapy and not everyone is able to do that, and NHS waiting lists are long. Um, I see paying for therapy in, as the same way I would saving for a pension, in that it is an investment in my future mental health. And it has been transformative for me in quite a slow way. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like a glacier creeping along, and I never really see the change, and then suddenly I'll realise I'm just much stronger in myself, and I'm much more aware where feelings come from. And... Um, I mean, one of the key examples I can give you is that when I was going through IVF and I thought I was dealing with it fine, but there was still something in me that, that said to myself, if this second round of IVF fails, I think I will need professional health help. And I went to see a therapist recommended by a friend of mine who I ended up seeing for two and a half years. And one of the first things she asked me in my first session was, 
how's your marriage? And I said, oh, it's great, it's fine, it's really good, it's really good. <laughs> and um, of course, what she had rightly identified was that I probably wouldn't be there if everything in my marriage was fine, and that I was feeling alone and that I needed some help. And um, she really made me, she really helped me realize what was actually going on for me. And I am forever grateful because I really do think, and this is not um, over-exaggerated language, I, I, she saved my life in many ways. She really did because it was so useful having an objective counterpoint to the internal narrative that I had and the external narrative that I was trying to present to the world. It was a, a place where I could be completely honest. So she was great, and um, I stopped seeing her because um, things seemed to be going better. And um, then in October 2017, when all this other stuff happened, I started seeing another therapist who I'm still seeing on a weekly basis. And sometimes I have nothing to say because sometimes things feel pretty good, but I, I know that it's a useful exercise for me. So I'm a big proponent of it. But also, it's okay if your therapist isn't great to get another one. It's so totally to fail fine. In therapy. Oh my gosh, but I actually really struggled <laughs> I've with had that. So many. <laughs> I really think yes, that's so funny you say that because I actually I really struggle with like, having to draw things to a close and I massively struggle with silence in a session I, because I constantly feel like I have to be chatty. <laughs> yeah, you haven't failed if you change therapists. <laughs> um, so there was um, there was one uh, yes. Um, so I'm going to talk about what you talked about the twenties because I think you touched a note and I realized that maybe that maybe I'm around people who feel the same way. Mm. And it was so refreshing, maybe you, from a perspective of someone who's in your 30s, and you actually touch on the point that maybe a lot of us in the 20s are thinking, oh my God, I've got, I've got something to prove here. And I think it, it's maybe it's hard to be around people who are feeling the same way. Um, so yeah, I feel like a way, it's like sort of like being taken off my shoulder, but at the same time, I, I thought it was really refreshing. So I was just wondering, what are the tips you have? Uh, tips? Tips. For, for your the, 20s. What, what to concentrate in your 20s. Like, I think it gave me permission, in a way, when you're talking, yeah. to maybe concentrate on something else, like not concentrate on this sense of achievement and mm. sense of proving yourself, but maybe discovering yourself and traveling and attempting these things that are a bit scary, but what else? Yeah. yeah how, how would you yeah. recommend going about that? How old are you? 24. 24. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for your beautiful question. The top thing that I would say to you is that it's not a race, even though it, you're made to feel like it is, but it really isn't. And if it doesn't feel like you're doing exactly as well as you should be doing in every single area of your life or exactly as well as someone else is doing, don't feel resentful about the other people because they're on their path and doing their thing. And secondly, just ease up on yourself because your 20s are a decade when you can try out lots of things and you can find out who you are. And you don't have to be doing everything brilliantly all at once. I promise you that as time passes, it's just a really wonderful gift because you work out what it is that makes you content and who you are as a person. So it's not a race. Don't worry about what other people are doing and don't be scared of age. It's really great. <laughs> but, you, but there is a thing about risk because you saying that you, when you split up um, yeah. with that boy in October 2017, I mean, it does feel more risky to make big decisions at yeah. that point in your life. But risk, taking those risks can be exhilarating, as we talked about upstairs, and actually making a decision even when you're slightly more risk averse because you're older and more conservative. Yeah is actually a good thing. Definitely, and one of the things that I talk about in the book is about having been on The Observer for eight years as a staff feature writer and not feeling that my career was progressing at all. And on one level, my career was great because I was a feature writer at The Observer. On another, I was like, I just, there was something in me that hankered for more and I knew that I wanted to be taken seriously as an author as well. And, um, and I quit The Observer after eight years, almost in like a fit of adrenaline. I had no plan about what to do next. And no other job to go to. No other just... job to go to, just, <laughs> just myself. And in a way, that was so empowering because I took a big gamble on myself and it paid off and it was one of the best things that I've ever done. And I'm so much happier being a freelance writer. But you're right that I needed to take that gamble and like, launch myself into the unknown. So scary. Is there any more? Oh, uh, there's two people here, a lady and a gentleman. Um, when would you say is the best time in your life to make the most failures, the one that you can learn the most from? 
Oh, that's such a good question. I, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm not an oracle, <laughs> so I feel like I could answer that question better when, when I'm it's like 95, God willing. Um, but for me so far, when has been the best age to make? I actually think um, my, mid, my mid-30s were a good time, because for me personally, because by then I got through the chaos of my 20s, I understood a bit more about who I was, but not massively. And it was still at a time when I could m- make a change and have a, a, another job and another career and another relationship because I wasn't too old. So for me, that felt like the best time. So around 35, I would say, <laughs> looking back. We've got time for one more question. Was, did you want to ask a question? Or you point at the gentleman behind? No? No. <laughs> oh, there was one. Yeah. Oh, just here at the back. Last one. Hi there. Um, I uh, was uh, intrigued by your comment about the Los Angeles versus being here perspective. And I'm American, as you can hear, and I've been in the UK for a long time and have my own thoughts about the American approach to failure and resilience versus the UK approach. And I wanted to ask your perspective on that. Um, is it, and it maybe is an arrogant comment, but is it er- an innate of Americans to be more open to failure mm-hmm. or... Or what? And then the second question is, is your book in the U.S.? Is it selling in the U.S.? And what's the response in America, if so? Oh, what a lovely question. Um, (laughs) uh, My experience, which is uh, L.A., basically, so I know that that's not representative of America as a whole, but my experience in L.A. was that people were so much more open about everything. And it was the only place I've ever been where women on the street that I'd never met before would stop and say, I really like what you're wearing. And there was no overtone. There was no ulterior motive to that. It was just um, so much more open and encouraging place to be. And, um, and I feel that in my experience of America was that the hierarchies are a lot flatter. And America has its own issues, but in Britain I still think we are riven by a sense of class. Mm-hmm. So in America, when I was there as a journalist, it was so much easier for me to get interviews with the chief of police, for instance, because they would be willing to be open to give me the opportunity to talk to them. And it felt as though I were living somewhere where the possible was celebrated. Whereas I think London, which I love to the ends of the earth, and I am a Londoner, and it's such an incredible city, but in some respects, it's a hard city. And I feel like a native Londoner sees it as an achievement to get to the end of the day. They see it as a sort of obstacle course, and they've managed to get over various obstacles, the tube delays and queues at Sainsbury's. And you feel this like sense of achievement at the end of the day, but also exhaustion. Whereas LA was a city geared up to be easy for its inhabitants. And it doesn't always get it right, but that was the foundational premise. And so within that, um, my, again, my specific experience of LA, I was hanging out with lots of writers rather than actors. And um, it definitely, I had a lot of conversations about failure and kind of failed scripts as much as failed relationships, as much as failed dinners that you tried to cook. And there was something really generous about that spirit. And um, I do really love it there for that reason. And the second part of your question, How to Fail has not yet got an American publisher. Um, my last two novels are available in America. But no, How to Fail isn't yet. And I, maybe it's because I am British and a lot of the people I quote are British. But um, you know, I feel it'd be great. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be great. I could do an American book tour. Are you an American publisher? I mean, feel free. <laughs> I'll come with you. Yes, you can come with me. Um, so I've become your glamorous yeah. assistant. <laughs> so thank you very much for your brilliant questions. And Elizabeth is going to be signing books in the foyer for um, anyone who has any other questions they want to ask her. And, um, and so could everyone help me? <laughs> thank you. <laughs>